I'd like to thank Creative Mornings for inviting me uh, for this uh, talk. And uh, the motivation was, the, the Current Conservation is a magazine that tries to bring art and science together. And I want to take us through a journey of how uh, I arrived at, at, um, uh, at this juncture. Uh, and some of the sort of art meets science uh, 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 adventures that, that I've been on through sort of my 20 years of experience in, in ecology. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a turtle story. One of the reasons that I got inspired to work on turtles was there was a guy that, uh, of whom was said uh, by um, uh, Janaki Lennon and Rom Whitaker, uh, Rom's a recently minted Padma Shri that you might have read about, uh, India Snake Man. And many stories of people that work in sea turtles, on sea turtles in India start with uh, hanging around snake park, bunking college usually. Uh, and uh, many of these people would, still, when, when, I, when I talked to them, they would say they were hanging around and Ram would walk up to them and say, hey man, do you want to clean a snake pit? And 30 years later, they were ecologists or herpetologists or uh, photographers or whatever. Satish did some amazing things, which we, as college students, we heard about. In uh, the 1970s, he went out to an uninhabited island in Lakshadweep and spent five months there by himself. This island is six hours from the nearest uh, inhabited island in the Lakshadweep. And he was there for five and a half months all by himself on a little island that he could walk around. Seen here with uh, uh, the Satish Bhaskar in the middle and Ram to his uh, uh, left. On one occasion, um, when he was uh, doing sea turtle surveys in uh, West Papua and in Indonesia, uh, he uh, was single-handedly tagging hundreds of leatherbacks. He used to swim out to a boat to give mail. Uh, but interestingly, when 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 people went to visit, uh, what they the, the local people had um, come up with the story that this strange guy came from a foreign country and tagged these turtles with little metal tags, and uh, at the end of it. Uh, you know, went back to his country and used a giant magnet and attracted all these turtles back to his country. And that's why they had, all the turtles had uh, sort of, uh, the numbers had gone down. Now, while all of this was going on, uh, we were college students and there were, uh, since the 70s, Ram, Whitaker and, and Satish and others had started these turtle walks on the Chennai coast. And as students, we felt that we wanted to do something to save turtles. And so we set up uh, there had been hatcheries that uh, the forest department had maintained, but we set up a students group in 1989 and started uh, helping with the conservation of sea turtles. And that's how I kind of got involved with, with sea turtle biology and conservation. Um, Forty years later, that group still exists. Uh, but uh, very uh, to come back to sea turtles themselves, while I, over the next 20 years that I worked on sea turtles, I discovered many amazing things about them um, very quickly. Uh, there are seven species of sea turtle worldwide. Uh, the largest is a leatherback turtle, grows up to six or seven feet in length and can weigh up to 600 or 700 kilograms. Uh, hawksbill turtles, green turtles, and olive ridleys that I'll talk about a little bit more uh, in a bit. Uh, these are the four species that we find in India. What's amazing, what, what uh, I found truly amazing as I started to get, get to know more and more about them are these incredible life, life cycles that they have. Uh, they migrate thousands of kilometers from their breeding to their feeding grounds and then uh, lay uh, mate in offshore waters, lay a few clutches of eggs which are 100 to 150 in each, in each nest. Uh, when they incubate, the sex of the hashlings is determined by temperature. Uh, so unlike, um, unlike mammals and, 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 and humans and most other animals, they don't have sex chromosomes. The temperature of the nest determines whether they become males or females. The hashlings, when they emerge, they find the sea using light. And so if there's a lot of flight on the beach, they get um, disoriented and many of them don't find their way to the sea. Uh, and then they use the Earth's magnetic field to, to navigate. So there's really some very, very fascinating things about their biology uh, with regards to how they orient, how they navigate, how they find their way around the world and so on. Some of the work that we ourselves did, some of the work that I've been involved in, in uh, involved tracking some of these turtles. So we track leatherbacks from the Andaman Islands. Uh, and we found that they can swim as far uh, east as Western Australia and as far west as uh, Mozambique and Madagascar. Uh, so it's pretty much across the entire Indian Ocean. Uh, we also work, um, and my colleague Murli is here, who work, we've been working on the mass nesting populations of olive ridleys in Orissa. Olive ridleys do this amazing thing. Uh, once a year uh, during the season, uh, thousands of them will come out to nest. Uh, this, is a, this is an occasion on which uh, I think on a single night we counted 60,000 turtles. And so during one nesting event, you might have 
uh, 150, 200, 250,000 turtles nesting within a span of a few days. So this is again a bird's eye view of the 2015 Aribada taken with a drone. Uh, these, those are actually adult turtles on the beach. We also tracked turtles and we found that that, uh, uh, that Olive Ridley's on the coast of Orissa swim across the Bay of Bengal. Many of them uh, feed off the coast of Sri Lanka. Now, in the early 2000s, at some point, so all of this is leading up to something, right? So in the early 2000s, I'm doing all of this work on sea turtles and I give, one, I give a talk that sounds somewhat similar to this. And uh, uh, one of the people that was in the audience that was associated with Pratham Books comes up to me and says, uh, that sounds really fascinating. Children would love it. You should do a children's story. And I'm like, what? I mean, what does it, you know, how does one write a children's story about turtles? But um, uh, sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing that the, the apart from these beautiful, you know, beautiful things about the biology, over the last 30, 40 years, the sea turtles like tigers and elephants and other uh, species have also faced a lot of threats. So they used to be caught in fishing nets and shipped to Calcutta for meat. Um, and a young lady called Vijaya sort of uh, was spearheaded a conservation movement in the 80s. Uh, I mention her because she will reappear later in the story. Uh, but in the last 20 years, a lot of turtles have also died in, in, in trawl nets. Given all of this background, uh, Turtle Story was born. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I would call it my first foray into the into the worlds of you know into attempting to bring art and science together uh, turtle story honestly was was kind of a fairly linear story a little hashling starts out uh, goes out into the you know, into the ocean escapes all of these predatory fishes meets all of these other species of turtles meets mr leatherback and uh, eventually of course has to uh, you know migrate back to her breeding ground when she becomes an adult, uh, she faces many dangers such as trawl nets and um, giant sharks and so on. Anyway, she finds her way back, she lays nests and you know her hatchlings come out and the hatchlings go out into the sea and it was a very sort of linear uh, story and of course Maya Ramaswamy who did the illustrations did a fabulous job and so the books look looks beautiful and there's some copies that you can look at. But you get sucked into these things so when I um, had done one and it came out and everybody said, it looks so pretty, it looks so pretty. And then, you know, I'm like, oh, cool, that sounds nice. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to take, receive the praise for it. It's like lovely book, isn't it? Yes, illustrations are lovely. <laughs> I worked so hard, but uh, uh, it just seemed uh, like, a, like a cool thing to do. Uh, so I started thinking about, um, you know, an another one. And uh, during the course of my own sort of uh, doctoral work, I'd, been, I'd, I'd uh, come across these uh, tree frogs, uh, which eventually a student of mine did his PhD on. Tree frogs are beautiful. They're found in the Western Ghats, uh, this particular genus of tree frogs, and you get dozens of really, really beautiful species. So it was born this somewhat fantastic tale of the adventures of Philotus frog, um, who, like his um, somewhat namesake, attempted uh, a start, makes an attempt to go around the world. So he's heard about this big, big sea somewhere. He's never been down from a tree, and so he sets off to find the sea. And what happens in this story really, which I think um, happens somewhat organically, is while, while, while sort of painting the picture, so to speak, uh, he comes across a lot of really interesting friends. He comes across uh, hornbills and frogmouths and lion-tailed macaques, black and orange flycatchers. Um, this particular species of frog that was discovered about 10 years ago, it's about 100 million years old and it's the only frog belonging to this family that's found in, in this in the world actually uh, and this is amazing discovery lives lives under un, underground and only comes out during the monsoon uh, so i i accidentally discovered that this was a that that uh Tavale going out was an interesting way uh, for you know to talk to people children or otherwise, about all of these interesting animals that they don't otherwise, you know, typically encounter. So it's like most of the time people are only reading about, you know, tigers and lions and, and elephants and, and so on. After I finished writing this book, I, uh, uh, a colleague told me, he said, uh, 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 he's, another, he's also an evolutionary biologist. He said, you know, I, I, I have one, you know, I liked your book, but I have one fault to find. Uh, this person works on a bird called short wings, which are also endemic to the Western Ghats, and they're also really like sort of be, have been there for millions of years. And he said, "Oh, you know, uh, the uh, I had written somewhere in the book that Tavale's friend, the wobbler, had flown down from far and told him about something." And he said, "No, it's the short wing that's really his friend." And I thought about it, and I said, uh, "Yes, you know, that's quite true, and therefore there needs to be a a, a sequel." 
as, as you can see in this sort of, in, in my train of thought, that is getting closer and closer in some sense to, this, to, the, to the science that we actually do. So when I'm thinking about the sequel, I'm thinking about the, the research that we do. And while we were doing a, a, a book event for the Adventures of Philotus Frog, my student Vijay, who's done his PhD on turtles, comes and talks about his, his thesis, which is about uh, going across the entire Western Ghats uh, to each of those mountain chains that you see over there, uh, and sampling each of them for these bush frogs and collecting hundreds of specimens, uh, samples and build, doing this complex phylogenetic analysis, uh, which I'm not going to sort of like go into very much, but just to say that uh, we found these different evolutionary groups in the northern and southern guards, uh, lots of canopy frogs in the, in, in the southern western guards, very few of them in the north, many grassland frogs in the north. And all of this, uh, and leading to uh, you know, these evolutionary theories about how frog species form. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm thinking about how do I now tell this story through Tavle's eyes? Uh, but we'll have to wait for that. There are, uh, so Tavle's uh, future uh, adventures involve his, uh, another journey across the Western Guards. But this really is to tell the story of the evolution of frogs in the Western Guards. Uh, not yet out, but um, uh, that's, that's what I'm currently working on. Um, that's what we're working on now. Uh, the last story, uh, the frog part of the story, is a uh, is an is another sort of longer children's novel that that came out last year through Penguin, uh, and uh, the story starts with uh, uh, a slender lorry, the Loris, seeing an animal that she can't identify, uh, a mysterious animal in the in the Western Ghats that looks like a cat, uh, but nobody knows what it is. Have you seen lorises in Bangalore? Any of you? Well, there are lorises in Bangalore. They're on they're there on uh, the IIC campus and other places where there's enough sort of vegetation. So you, you you can actually see these in Bangalore. Now, the story, of course, starts with Laurie, the loris, and uh, uh, racket-tailed drongo. But the premise of this friendship is the idea of mixed species foraging flocks. Now, mixed species foraging flocks are, are multiple species of, of, of birds that come together and feed on insects together. And there's a lot of ecological research about why they do this. Do they do this because they get foraging benefits? Are they able to find insects better because they're foraging together? Or does it afford them protection from predators? Uh, so the large sort of uh, body of uh, scientific and ecological research on mixed species foraging groups is why do they form? Is it for anti-predatory benefits or is it for foraging benefits? And my research group has been working on um, uh, mixed groups in birds, mixed group, uh, mixed feeding groups in reef fish and so on. Um, the third character in the story is, uh, is an owl uh, who uh, of course, is potentially a predator of these animals, but ends up being part of this group. Now, where did that, you know, where, where did that come from? Uh, when uh, uh, Mira and I were in Great Nicobar and I was studying leatherback turtles, some of which, you know, some of the pictures which you saw, she was doing a project on the Nicobar tree shrew, which is a tiny little, uh, a tiny mammal. Uh, and what we found was, of course, that these drongos were, were following them around and feeding on the insects that the uh, tree shrew would flush out of the, uh, you know, flush from the bark. And this was expected. Drongos tend to do that. But we also found the sparrow hawk, which we thought would be attempting to attack them, also feeding with this. So this predator was actually also, instead of attempting to, to, to attack these, uh, these other animals, was actually uh, had uh, uh, come to the conclusion that the maximum benefit for him was to hang around and also feed on flushed, flushed prey. Uh, geckos and, and, and so on. Uh, and so as um, the trio of uh, Laurie and, and Drongo and, and uh, Mr. Owl is sort of in some sense uh, was born from this real sort of uh, uh, real uh, group that, that we saw out in one of our studies. Other interesting things, ha uh, uh, Laurie encounters other interesting animals. Um, uh, for example, there's uh, the, the, the leopard Sirute who is um, uh, an angry grumpy leopard because he was uh, he wandered into a village got trapped by people and got relocated far away uh, there's uh, we have colleagues whose research has shown that when you when you trap when you when you translocate leopards uh, they tend to get uh, obviously like like uh, uh, 
people would as well, completely disoriented, and that's when they actually become far more dangerous. Uh, she also found that uh, some of the leopards that they then subsequently tracked to figure out where they were going would walk right back to where, hundreds of kilometers back to where they were originally trapped. Uh, so there's a beautiful track that you can find on uh, on the internet. Uh, my colleague's name is Vidya Atreya and she's been studying these leopards. They caught it in Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Bombay, released it, I, I, I think it's about 500 or 600 kilometers away, across the Ghats, uh, and the track Track is like a is like a road. It, the leopard goes west to the Western Ghats, uh, turns right, and walks straight up right back to uh, Borivili. As I said, I'd come back to Vijaya. Vijaya, amongst the many cool things during that she did during her her, her short life, was that she went down to, to Kerala to track down this turtle that hadn't been seen for uh, over a hundred years or eighty nine years or something, and she found it and. Uh, Vijay, the turtle, makes an appearance in the book, but the turtle itself, the, the real forest cane turtle, was renamed uh, after Vijaya, so it's now called Vijaya Kilis. Uh, so all of that and more, um, the many sort of adventures that that Laurie has and uh, uh, gets passed with uh, help from her friends. I guess the, the largest sort of picture I'm telling over here is that there's a, there's a world of science and uh, uh, as I as I said uh, um, to, a, to a group a few um, months ago, uh, humans have been communicating through art for as long as human history exists, right? Even cavemen knew that the best way to communicate was through art. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, scientists basically lost that ability or forgot about it or didn't get the memo. So scientists spend most of their life, life communicating to a small community of a few thousand people, uh, write papers that at the most eight other people will read uh, and think that they've been wildly successful. We had a science communication panel at a, uh, at a conference recently and I was, uh, you know, I was sharing, uh, you know, three of my publications. Uh, one of my most cited papers, which has been cited like a hundred times, um, a popular a popular non-fiction book that's probably sold about a thousand copies and Philotus Frog which has sold about 15,000 copies across 10 languages, right? And one asks oneself, which is, you know, which is doing the best job of getting across across to people? In parallel, about 10 years ago, we um, uh, started um, a magazine uh, that really was intended to communicate science to a wider audience. Uh, and current conservation started out with uh, short, succinct summaries of scientific papers, but then since then we've expanded out to a range of different article types, including a section for children. Uh, so now we have, we have you know, short stories, poetry, essays, and, and uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of features. Uh, and about six years ago, uh, I had, a, uh, for a couple of years, I had a guest uh, editor who actually came, you know, we started out mostly with photographs and images and, 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 and articles who said, you know, why should, you know, why aren't we using more other, you know, visual mediums to communicate science. Uh, this has now grown where uh, we're doing a variety of different kinds of, uh, of illustrations. We're now in the process of thinking of not just editorial illustrations, but a range of different illustration types as well uh, to communicate uh, to communicate science. Uh, one of the sections that we're starting this year is um, summaries of research papers as cartoons. Uh, and uh, well-known science comic illustrator Ron Chakravarti is going to be doing that series for us. Uh, so a bunch of different exciting things around the idea of bringing art and science together. In closing, I, I think it's, uh, people ask me, uh, so I've told I've told today's story in a also in a in a somewhat linear fashion. You know, when these books have come out, people have said, "Do you write them to communicate science?" And the answer is no. I don't write them to communicate science. I write them because they're fun to write and they look beautiful when people illustrate them. Uh, and I think the the larger goal of current conservation is we don't want people to be writing. We, people are writing for us today because they want to tell a story about their science. But eventually, we want we, we want this to be a platform where people are writing for the pleasure of writing and for the pleasure of uh, having their work uh, illustrated and look beautiful uh, and the illustrators are working because they're able to tell stories about the world because they're sort of engaging with, with the scientists. So uh, what we really like, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I, I, we'd like to create a, a, a community where people are creating these, 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 uh, these products for, 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 for a larger, um, wider public audience uh, for, so, for the 
uh, for the pleasure it gives them. Uh, in, in the same manner that I've sort of tripped and stumbled and found my way into this addiction for uh, writing children's stories that I don't seem to be able to uh, give up.